afterwards. Okay, so our first speaker uh, is Ambassador Peter Woolcott, who is Australia's Ambassador for the Environment. As part of his portfolio, he leads Australia's negotiations under the UN Convention, uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change. Mr. Woolcott served in a broad range of senior diplomatic postings, it's a long, long list, uh, and was Chief of Staff to the then Minister of Foreign Affairs between 2002 and 2004. Please welcome Peter Woolcott. Uh, thank you, Frank, and, and the Crawford School for the invitation to be here with you today. It's good to be back here at the ANU, where I studied many years ago. It's also a pleasure to be speaking to such a knowledgeable audience and one so actively engaged in driving the climate change agenda. After I speak, David Druin will talk about Australia's domestic processes to develop Australia's post-2020 target and some of the policy options we are considering. So what I want to do today is provide the international context for Dr. Gruen's remarks by talking about progress on a new climate change agreement and post-2020 targets. And to give you a sense of how Australia will contribute to the global response in a way that is responsible and fair. As you know, 2015 is a crucial year for the global response to climate change. So uh, what is it that we want to achieve in what I might call the Paris Project? The first part of the Paris Project is securing a new global climate change agreement under the United Nations Climate Change Convention in Paris in December. The Paris Agreement should create a common platform for all countries to contribute to global efforts to tackle climate change from 2020 and ramp up their efforts over time. So what kind of agreement will help to achieve this and what should this agreement look like? First, the agreement should be applicable to all countries with a common playing field for action. The new climate, uh, global climate agreement must deal with the current and future global distribution of energy use, emissions and wealth, which has tra changed dramatically over the past two and a half decades and will continue to change this century. It shouldn't replicate the status quo under the Kyoto Protocol, where action on climate change depends on countries' level of development in 1992. The Kyoto Protocol now covers just 37 countries and 14% of global emissions. In 1992, the OECD developed countries and Russia accounted for 65% of the world's energy demands. Today, their share is now less than 50%. In 1992, there are only three developing countries in the top 10 emitters. Today, there are six, and overall developing, developing countries now account for three-fifths of global emissions. So looking forward, the International Energy Agency tells us developing countries will have to achieve over two-thirds of global mitigation by 2030. This change reality goes beyond emissions. Developing country GDP has surpassed developed country GDP. By the end of this decade, for example, China will surpass the US to be the world's largest economy, and India will move past Japan to be the world's third largest. So if we are serious about taking effective action on climate change, we cannot afford to perpetuate a bifurcated system that excludes the ever-increasing majority of the world's economic and emissions output. We need to have a realistic footing for a future action that reflects the realities of the world around us. The second thing the agreement should have is clear, credible and quantifiable commitments by all countries, especially the major economies and our key trading partners. While Australia is the world's 13th largest emitter, we produce only 1.3% of global emissions, and this share is expected to drop to 1.1% by 2020. The top 20 emitters produce over 80% of the world's emissions, so it is critical that all the major emitters take durable and effective action on climate change. Now, thirdly, the agreement should allow countries to determine their own emissions reduction targets and policies. There's no way that each and every single country's targets and policies can be negotiated between the 196 parties to the UNFCCC. They must be nationally determined. And countries must have ownership of their targets and policies in a way that supports strong and effective action over the longer term. Finally, the agreement should contain rules to ensure the transparency and credibility of countries' actions. This is crucial so we can compare countries' efforts and make sure their actions are real and genuine. There's a long road ahead in the negotiations to secure such an agreement in Paris. We started the year with a week-long negotiating session in Geneva in February with two new co-chairs from the United States and Algeria. They favoured accommodating all parties' views to build confidence and trust in their handling of the process and foster ownership by parties of the draft text. Parties were given the opportunity to add to the text carried over from Lima, and they did this with alacrity. As a result, the draft text has doubled in size to 86 pages with over 300 paragraphs. It is now a wish list of all the things parties want in the agreement. 
The big challenge, and it is a big challenge, is now to streamline the text into workable options on each of the key issues. While I'm relatively new to the climate change, I've spent some time up to my elbows in other UN negotiations, and I expect this will be a long and slow-moving process. Parties will be reluctant to let go of their ideas and make concessions until later in, or late in the negotiations. But this process is critical, as it will give us a sense of where the political landing zones might lie. We're already starting to see senior political engagement from France and others, and this will be crucial to the final outcome. It will also require a strong role from the co-chairs. I'll come back to this issue and how we will approach Paris in a moment. Let me turn to the second piece of the Paris project. That is, countries intended nationally determined contributions, or INDCs. This, of course, is the post-2020 targets. Parties to the UNFCCC have agreed to submit their INDCs well in advance of Paris, to quote, in a manner that is transparent and helps to provide clarity and understanding of their contributions. There is also agreement that countries' INDCs should be focused on mitigation. Adaptation can be included as an optional component. And we have agreed that each country's INDC will represent a progression beyond its current <coughs> undertaking. In other words, there's an expectation of no backsliding from existing commitments. We'll take into account these agreed international parameters in setting Australia's post-2020 target. And we look forward to seeing countries coming forward with their INDCs over the course of the year. We welcome the announcement of Switzerland, the first country to formal table its INDC, followed by the European Union, the first major economy. Both INDCs are more ambitious than each country's 2020 targets, and both explain which emissions will be covered, how the targets will be achieved, and how the target is fair and responsible. I won't go into a detailed analysis of their targets for a couple of reasons. Firstly, there are other speakers here today who are much better qualified to do so than me. And secondly, we are mindful of the complexity in comparing targets across countries. There will be differences such as starting levels of emissions, base years and end years, and different national circumstances and economic structures. We'll obviously look at the detail of these targets and those of other major economies, in particular the US and China, as we consider a target for Australia. We'll also look at the actions of Australia's key trading partners, particularly those in the Indo-Pacific region. We understand the challenges that these emerging economies face in balancing their respective priorities in setting a post-2020 target. This is why last week my department hosted a workshop in Canberra to assist Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand and Vietnam in their target preparation. One question which I'd like to touch on briefly is whether the country's targets, and indeed the agreement itself, will be legally binding. This is, of course, why the C in INDC stands for contribution and not commitment. Australia is approaching this issue pragmatically and maintains an open mind. As I said earlier, the most important thing is to have all countries take action from a common platform and implement their actions back home. So one approach could be the targets themselves are not legally binding, but the agreement itself, specifically the requirement to come forward with targets, is legally binding. For Australia, setting a post-2020 emissions reduction target will be the focus of our target setting process, but we'll also consider other important aspects of our climate change response, including adaptation. We know that the world is already feeling the impact of, climate cha of changing climate, and we also know that Australia will be vulnerable to these impacts. All levels of Australian government will have a role to play in this response. The federal government plays a key role in managing the potential impacts on economic growth, on providing quality information to inform decision making, and removing barriers to private sector engagement. State and territory governments have a direct implementation role, particularly through building resilience at local level and in the context of their planning and land use decision making. Good adaptation outcomes will come from all levels of government working together. The Paris Agreement should encourage all parties to do exactly that. Now, the announcement of targets well before Paris is important. Countries will come to the table paired with their national actions and invested in a global climate deal. This is something that will set Paris apart from Copenhagen. Nevertheless, Paris will be difficult. There are still issues that will be tough to resolve, such as how to move past binary differentiation of developed and developing countries, and how to best support climate finance and adaptation efforts at the national and international levels. Now, I've already spoken about our approach to differentiation, but on climate finance, it is important to emphasize that Australia continues to support the collective goal agreed at Copenhagen to jointly mobilise US dollars 100 billion per year by 2020 from public and private sources to address the needs of developing countries. This commitment is not unique or specific to Australia, rather it is by all the developed countries together playing their part. Just as with mitigation, the Paris Agreement must reflect current and future economic realities for climate finance as well. It must reflect the fact that developing countries are getting wealthier and have greater domestic capacity to take action. Indeed, they are expanding their traditional donor base. For example, Indonesia, Mexico and the Republic of Korea have all pledged to the Green Climate Fund. 
It must also reflect the fact that the private sector will play a significant role in the, in the implementation of action under a new agreement and is already the largest source of international climate uh, finance, international pri climate finance. International private capital does not differentiate itself along static lines. It is focused on outcomes. Governments clearly have an important role in shaping the economic conditions to enable and catalyse such investments. But the reality of that role will be to facilitate these investments by removing barriers to investment and creating appropriate enabling environments. Public finance is inherently finite, finite so it must be well targeted. We also recognise the importance, especially for the most vulnerable countries, of building resilience and effective adaptation to prepare for climate change impacts. This is a priority for Australia's aid program. Our domestic experience and our, exper and our experience in providing assistance to our partners highlights the need for adaptation considerations to be appropriately integrated into major planning and development decisions. This is a key to protecting development gains and promoting sustainable economic growth, particularly in the Indo-Pacific region. While the Paris Agreement should focus on mitigation, we recognise the need for adaptation to be appropriately recognised. Mitigation and adaptation are both critical to an effective and enduring international response. And the Paris Agreement should advance global cooperation on adaptation through approaches that are fit for purpose and keep the focus on the underlying task of improving national and local level planning. To briefly address loss and damage, we continue to support the Warsaw Mechanism and will engage constructively in implementing its agreed work plan and when it comes under review in 2016. We're working collectively with countries to address loss and damage in a practical fashion through a focus on risk management. Like many developed and developing countries, we do not support claims for compensation. Rather, our focus is on preparation and action. So as stated earlier, in moving towards Paris, we can expect that these tough issues will need to be resolved through high-level political engagement. The key will be working out when and how to sequence that political engagement into the process. We, our French hosts and other countries, will need to think this through carefully. Australia will continue to play a constructive role in the negotiations towards Paris. We want a strong and effective outcome from Paris, and for this to happen, we must be careful not to let Paris sink under the weight of expectations. It is important to think of Paris as a way station, not the end of the road. Now, in late 2015, the UNFCCC will look at what tabled INDC had up to. I expect civil society will do the same. It is highly likely that collectively more effort will be needed to meet the long-term goal of limiting the temperature rise to below two degrees. But what Paris can deliver is setting us on the right path forward by setting up a platform that sees all countries committed to acting together and building climate action in a predictable and lasting way. And this is what I mean when I talk about the Paris project. The other important thing that Paris can do is continue to catalyse practical action and collaboration between governments businesses and other community organisations, the things that make international targets real. Australia has long been engaged in cooperative initiatives beyond the international negotiations. For example, we're working with China to improve the emissions efficiency of coal and the accounting and transparency of its emissions reporting. We also work through global initiatives to promote research, development and deployment of technologies to reduce emissions in areas such as agriculture and carbon capture and storage. We're also continuing to demonstrate our goodwill, including through our $200 million contribution to the Green Climate Fund over four years, which will deliver economic benefits and emission reductions in key sectors like energy and forestry. Australia has played a constructive role on the Green Climate Fund board. We have used our seat to ensure the GCF is designed to achieve results through effective and efficient operations. For example, we've helped the board to establish a private sector facility and assist countries to set policies and build capacity to attract private sector finance. We've also helped the board to establish policies and procedures for the del delivery of adaptation and mitigation programs so the GCF can start to get the money out the door before, well, soon after Paris anyway, and deliver concrete results on the ground. So to conclude, this brings me back to when, what I said at the start. Australia is committed to playing its part in the global response. We want to contribute in a way that is responsible and fair. This means working constructively in the negotiations towards a new global agreement and contributing through direct national and international action, and in particular, setting a post-2020 target. We've already achieved much. Australia's per capita emissions have fallen by one quarter since 1990, and the emissions intensity of our economy has fallen by one half. We've delivered on our first Kyoto commitment, and we're on track to meeting our 2020 target, which represents a 12% reduction on 2005 levels, comparable to the US commitment for the same period, despite continued population and economic growth. Our challenge is to take effective climate action that is consistent with strong economic and jobs growth, provides long-term certainty to businesses and strengthens our international competitiveness, and to communicate what Australia can realistically achieve given its unique national circumstances and characteristics 
including its resource endowment and economic and population growth. There will be different uh, views in government, business, industry, academia and the wider community about what this means and how to achieve it. And we welcome all of these views in our preparations for Australia's post-2020 target. I look forward to hearing some of these views today. And I'd like to thank you and the Crawford School for your contributions to this important debate. Thank you.